Hi, I'd like to welcome State Assembly Member Yuleen New from the State of New York, Assembly District 65, which is Lower Manhattan, including the District of, or including Chinatown. Hello, everyone. Thanks. So, Assembly Member New, how has COVID-19 impacted you and um, New York City? Um, so, I have talked about this at length, I think, with uh, a lot of folks who um, had, you know, kind of at first been interviewing us about, you know, different things that have been affecting especially the Asian American community. But um, my district was affected not, uh, very largely economically, um, not just because of the actual virus, but because of racism. Um, the racism and the xenophobia that occurred um, starting around February really uh, drove a lot of economic, uh, you know, hardships into my district. And you could start to see some of the things that were going on um, when you see online Facebook posts or tweets about, you know, folks shouldn't go into Chinatown, um, people shouldn't be eating in Chinese restaurants, people should, you know, there's a lot of this like negative, um, very disgusting uh, type of rhetoric that was actually hurting a lot of our communities because people were just um, being racist. And so, uh, a lot of the businesses who usually experience the most business during that period of time where it's uh, Chinese Lunar New Year and the celebrations that kind of come along with it, we started to see um, them struggle. And so, you know, my district, I uh, really kind of got to see a lot of what was going to happen in the rest of the state and in the rest of the nation, um, starting with my district because we started to see that a lot of businesses were running out of that runway that they needed to be able to stay open um, and then before things were even shut down uh, those businesses were having a very difficult time um, making ends meet paying rent um, and uh, you know making it so that they could pay their employees and keep their employees on etc so it just started getting harder and harder and harder have there been any successful policies put in place to help um, those businesses in particular no. Okay. Yeah. And so, answer, I know. <laughs> well, so has economic activity um, resumed at all? Yes. In your but, area? Because, yes. Um, I think that a lot of our businesses have uh, tried to kind of figure out what they can do. Right now, we're doing some outdoor dining. Right now, we're doing some, um, you know, work on trying to see who can open and what can open. Um, the governor has put things into phases and we are in the, um, you know, between, um, you know, when we can do sidewalk and outdoor seating, um, but we're still like trying to make sure that people are socially distanced and not gathering, um, you know, in giant groups. And so there's limits on how many people can be in the seating area and how many people can, um, be seated outside and then they're doing a lot of the different um you know i guess <laughs> sorry i don't have i don't know what i'm saying <laughs> like on top of that sorry about that um, i'll start over but yeah so right now we're doing a lot of uh outdoor seating was you know obviously uh, you know, folks have been trying to take out the PPP. A lot of folks have been trying to make sure that uh, their their employees or former employees can take unemployment. Um, a lot of folks have been trying to make sure that, you know, when they're doing any kind of outdoor dining, et cetera, that there are socially distanced dining. Um, people are able to come in and be able to, uh, you know, have a safe eating environment. And um, there's been uh, changes in how um, the government has been, um, you know, doing the phases. So, you know, in phase one, we didn't have any um, dining outside or anything like that. But now in phase three, um, they start to do outdoor dining. Um, so, you know, it's been an uh, interesting time and there's been a lot of different things that have changed along the way. Um, but we haven't really had a lot of um, help for our uh, residents in a lot of different ways. So right now we're seeing that people can't make ends meet um, and they can't pay rent. And uh, our commercial businesses all obviously can't pay rent. And um, that makes it hard so that, you know, 
the landlords also can't pay property taxes um, and certain other things that they need to do to keep the buildings up and running. And so I think that there's a lot of different things that are kind of seeing a domino effect. As folks can see, if you're not taking care of um, folks on the ground, then you know, you'll see a domino effect as, as people move into the business front and then also to the, um, the landowner front and then you'll see a lot more struggle as, as we go. So, um, you know, there needed to be a stop gap. Our, our budgets needed to provide that. Our city, state and federal governments needed to make sure that there was a way for folks to be able to have that stop gap, but um, that hasn't been provided. In addition to people not going to businesses in Chinatown, have there been um, hate incidents against Asian Americans in your community? Absolutely. Um, I think that it's been really uh, difficult because a lot of the things that you're seeing have been happening here in uh, New York City. Um, a lot of the things that folks saw about, you know, people being pushed into subway tracks or somebody being attacked for wearing a mask, somebody being attacked for not wearing a mask, the woman who was um, set on fire, <laughs> um, who was 89 years old, and um, there were a lot of, uh, I think, racially motivated incidences here in New York City, and, um, you know, I'm also somebody who gets a lot of these calls and comments as well, you know, um, in my office, like we've gotten calls like saying that I eat bats and, you know, uh, people saying that I um, need to go and get a cat and a dog and uh, put them in my walk and fry them. <laughs> and, you know, just things like that, that just feel uh, a compulsion to say to me. Um, because I'm the only Asian American woman in the entire New York State Legislature, they just feel they can, and so I think that that makes it so that you know uh, there's a, a general uh, fear right now about you know going out Asian. Thank you for sharing what's happening on the ground in your community. Um, so worldwide, people have seen the death of George Floyd and the resulting protests. Um, how has your area been affected and how has, how has your community reacted? Sure. Um, and I think that, you know, our, our area has been very affected because obviously people have seen what's been going on with the, um, with the rallies in New York City and obviously with a lot of the um, changes in our laws. Um, we repealed 50A. We did a lot of different things like um, made sure that people had to wear body cameras, etc. So like there's a lot of different pieces of legislation that we did um, in order to make sure to address some of the things that people were needing um, to see change. And uh, it was really good to see um, that we now had the political will to pay attention. And I think that, you know, even though it was, these were all big issues of mine, um, these were all big issues of the Black, Latino, Hispanic, Asian caucus, um, but they were not always the biggest issues for the rest of my conference, you know? And I think that that was really important for us to, um, to pass and, you know, it didn't matter that we were asking and asking and asking and asking. We needed like that push from everybody else in order to be able to get these things done. Um, and I think that uh, we've, we've seen the police brutality here in, uh, in our city for a long time. I mean, right in my district in lower Manhattan was where you saw um, a police officer beat a person very badly. Um, and that video went viral. And I think that, you know, for not wearing a mask while well, he wasn't wearing a mask, it was a very interesting that's a very interesting um, take, uh, I thought. But I think that you know our our community has really kind of um, needed to have this discussion for a very long time, and especially uh, within the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. And so you know I was part of a group um, with Fu actually and Sharon Tomiko Santos and David Chu and um, you know, uh, and Michelle Wu. And so we, we got together and we uh, talked about some of these issues, you know, with our friend Jeff Yang, 
um, and we talked about some of the issues and we, and we uh, helped to make sure that there was a voice for Asian Americans um, in this time period to be able to um, bridge a lot of those gaps and try to, you know, have uh, joint messaging. Because right now, you know, we have seen that, you know, lots of times in times of pain and crisis, uh, people have pit communities against one another uh, purposefully in order to um, make us fight over the same share of pie, right? Like the same piece of pie. And instead of like, you know, um, the smart thing, which is for us to actually get together and fight for more pie and all of the pie, <laughs> I think that it's really kind of, um, you know, really true that we're now seeing how interconnected we all are even more so than ever. Um, I mean, with COVID, it's undeniable. Like my healthcare depends on your healthcare and your healthcare depends on somebody else's healthcare. And we are all so interconnected that, you know, it's, it's, um, it's now more palpable than ever that we have to fight for each other. And I think that um, seeing some of the things that have been going on in all of our different communities, uh, we, really, we really need to make sure that we are, we are answering that call and making that change and able to to, to you know, be together in this fight. The, the current COVID-19 pandemic and Black Lives, Black Lives Matter movement has changed the state of the world drastically. What do you think is required of the United States and of the world going forward? I mean, I think it, the biggest thing is to acknowledge it's, um, the, the, the facts of it is that our systems are working the way that they are built to. They're not broken in any way. They're just, they're, they're designed to be racist, um, you know, patriarchal, misogynistic. They were built that way. Um, and I think that what we need to do is we need to look very, very deeply at um, how to basically dismantle these systems and put new things in place that are equitable and just. And I think that, you know, we need to look very deeply at the history and acknowledge it um, of the United States and the world on how um, systemically, uh, you know, and socioeconomically um, things are, things are uh, very, very uh, disparate. And I think that we need to answer those questions and we need to actually make those changes. So what are the overall challenges you anticipate for the next legislative session in New York? So in New York, I think the biggest things that we're going to have to look at is actually um, something that's a little bit personal to New York, um, which is how we do our budget. And we are looking at uh, doing budget justice bills and budget equity bills because of the fact that we saw how, um, you know, austerity budget after austerity budget wasn't going to work because we were literally cutting healthcare, education, and social services at a time when we needed these things funded even more so. And we needed to make sure that we had a strong infrastructure in order to be able to heal and bring people into recovery. And, um, and now instead, because of these austerity budgets and because of these cuts and because of the need and because of all these places where we did not put in the stop gaps for our housing, for our tenants, for our, you know, uh, small businesses, for the folks who are, you know, trying to uh, make ends meet every single day. Those are also the people who bring in jobs, our employers, et cetera. Like these are, um, when we're not providing these stop gaps, it makes it so that we fall further and further in, into that domino effect of seeing um, a, a economic crisis that's going to be so large, it's going to be much larger than the Great Recession, and it's going to be, um, you know, a, a depression that we're not going to have any way of getting out of if we're not building in any form of recovery. And we have not built in those forms of recovery, and we need to. And so in our New York 2021 session, I think that one of the biggest things that we need to do is actually we need to still finish in the 2020 session. This is what we need to do is what we need to do is we need to fix um, how our budget is made. Um, so in New York, something called Silver v. Pataki, which is a court uh, decision, uh, made it so that we are a strong governor state. And it makes it so that um, the governor has more say in the budget than the legislature does. And it makes it so when we don't pass the governor's budget, that makes it so that we have one chance to pass it or 
we shut down government, which makes it so that, you know, that danger prevents the legislature from actually um, putting forth a lot of the things that they should be putting forth, preventing cuts, for example. And, um, and then during this uh, pandemic, we actually uh, took a vote. Um, I voted against, obviously, um, but we took a vote that, um, and, and I don't want this to be triggering for anybody who's watching this, but which made it so that, um, you know, there was the, the right for the governor to make directives. And we all know where that takes us, right? Um, for folks who, who know when an executive order can make a directive over a person. Um, you know, the history of our country has shown that that's very dangerous. Uh, whether or not this governor would do something like the Japanese determined is something very different, um, we don't know. But, and I doubt that he would be a person who would do that, but that language being enacted into, um, into law and that language being allowed is something that um, can be a precedence that is set that allows for it to happen again and again and again. And we don't know if that would, uh, that would uh, one day lead to something again that is that harmful to a community. Um, and I think that we need to uh, be very careful about giving away our legislative powers um, so the legislature actually voted to give up our legislative powers to the executive and um, and that made it so that he didn't uh, if, the, if he makes cuts we have the right to come back and overturn the cuts but we don't have a right to stop the cuts from happening so these are very dangerous things and big differences in changes and so we need to work to take back that power and then we also need to make sure to over uh to repeal so we'll be attacking over turns to leave attacky with a constitutional amendment in order to make sure that we can um uh actually have equal say on the budget so right now as folks know like in new york it's very famous there's three people in a room who get to decide what the budget looks like and um we need to make sure that we are actually changing what that looks like in the process in which it takes place because right now the people's voice is not being heard and um, dangerous things are happening and we're not able to get the recovery that we need and deserve um and i think that uh we also need what's called budget justice right what we call budget justice which um, is making sure to uh, implement um, taxes that will uh, make sure that billionaires and multimillionaires are paying their fair share. Um, because right now in New York, obviously, um, people apparently care about whether or not a billionaire is going to move away from New York City rather than um, whether or not uh, people die. So uh, there's a, it's a pretty big difference. Um, there has never been a time in history when things have been this bad and uh, nobody has raised taxes on the wealthy, and yet in New York, uh, we fail to do so. So those are some of the things that we care mostly about. <laughs> so can you share with us some of the successes that have happened locally or statewide? Yeah, so I mean, I would say that, you know, sadly, we've um, kind of, as a government, uh, you know, our state government obviously isn't passing a budget with measures that will be healing. Our city government hasn't been passing measures that have been healing and our federal government obviously isn't helping us. So there's a, you know, many stepped, um, many stepped uh, process in uh, not helping. Um, so actually what's been really awesome to see is how um, people have been helping each other and how our neighborhoods have really been helping each other. And, um, you know, it hasn't stopped uh, as many of uh, the closures from happening that we, of course, want to stop. But I think that what's been really great is that, you know, there's been a lot of initiatives that have come up from young people um, that have really kind of changed the landscape of what could have been and what um, now can be instead. Um, and so, you know, I want to give some props to um, my buddy, Patrick. Uh, he is um, literally managing this little tiny 
whole normal restaurant um, on Mott Street. It's called 46 Mott. That's just literally what it's called. And um, 46 Mott is a little tiny deli, Chinese deli. And they have vows. They have, you know, little sticky rice things that you can get, you know, some herbal teas, <laughs> soy milk. And they're, they're very famous, uh, you know, soy pudding, tofu pudding. And I, you know, went up to them and I just, you know, we, we had a little bit of a brainstorm and we said like, why don't we feed people who are needing it right now? And we didn't realize that it would blow up and that that model would become one that people would take on all over the city and that there was also going to be people doing it all over the country. Um, but we got a, uh, I, I had a friend who um, was really wanting to do something. Um, so we connected him and Patrick and a couple of other folks with Patrick. And then we got some donations in to start just, and we thought that it would only be like a month um, of, you know, just providing meals every single day. Uh, and we did a hundred at first, the first day, and it was like, whoa, we need 150. Oh no, we need 200. And then um, we were providing hot, nutritious meals. You know, the city was putting out, you know, free lunches and free, you know, meals to take away with you. But those meals were full of sugar. It was Cheerios, um, milk, cookies, and um, chips and things like that, that you know, seniors who have diabetes and seniors who've had renal failure or anybody who, um, you know, is, uh, you know, allergic to milk or anything like that couldn't eat, right? And so we wanted to make sure that we were giving um, hot, nutritious meals. So there was a protein, always vegetables and over rice, right? And so it would be, um, you know, healthy for folks to eat and, and people lined up around the block. Um, it was, uh, it was so awesome, but also just like so heartbreaking to see um, because it was something that was so needed. And just having a hot meal can change somebody's day, obviously. And so we uh, continued it. Um, we were also providing dinners to uh, Beth Israel, the hospital, to the night shift there because um, a nurse had written to me and told me that they um, I didn't have takeout options and people forget them at night. <laughs> they, you know, people are always donating to, you know, the hospital during the day, but people forget them at night. So we were driving meals out there at like 9, 10 p.m. Um, to get them to the nurse's lunch, right? Because that's at night shift nurses, that's around the time they eat lunch. And so um, my mom's a nurse and she was always on the night shift. And so I know like it was already hard back then to even get food uh, delivered to them on a regular um, time, much less the time when there was a global pandemic when all the restaurants were shut down, right? So um, having that uh, delivery um, to folks was huge for them. Um, having um, the ability to get uh, groups like Rethink and um, folks like Patrick um, at 46 Mott to be able to do meals for folks. Um, Rethink Meals is another organization that was a nonprofit started by a friend of mine, Winston Chu, and um, it like was this little little idea that he had to to end hunger, right? But during this time, um, it was critical and it became a network for folks to be able to get food. Like in Chinatown, I think that they served no less than 150,000 meals in lower Manhattan. Um, so that, I mean, that was to, I mean, one third of my district is uh, public housing. And so that's to all the public housing, that's to folks who needed it um, in section eight, that's uh, to folks who needed it uh, just, you know, in any of the buildings who um, were big buildings that we could get folks who wanted those meals, right? So, I mean, this was, uh, just seeing people you know, loving the other people enough to be able to put that time and effort into creating these programs. And so these, I think, are some of the biggest successes that we saw in our neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, I, I can't say enough about some of our food pantries like Vision Urbana um, and then our settlement houses. So folks who don't have settlement houses you probably know them as neighborhood houses. Um, but these groups are folks who um, you know, kept our shelters running, kept the folks um, fed, you know, made sure that there was services for people. And I'm going to say this, like, our own office had to do wellness checks. Like, we did um, almost, like, 250,000 calls to people around our district. And, you know, we have, like, 
you know, in my district, the population is like 122,000 people, right? So that's like doubling calls, tripling calls. Um, some people just want to call like every other week. Um, there was, you know, um, and these calls are so important because like without this call, we wouldn't have discovered, for example, one of the seniors that um, her home care worker had, she had a stroke, but her home care worker had gotten COVID. And she had applied for somebody to take care of her patient and her patient, um, you know, couldn't apply for herself. Obviously she had had a stroke and, um, and we found her sitting in her own feces for four days because nobody had come. And so these are, these are moments when, you know, people just have to pick up a phone, pick up a meal, like take them to, you know, somebody and, you know, just do it themselves. Um, and unfortunately, it's come to that uh, because our government has not done its job. So I think that it's really amazing that people are willing to do that. And I think that, you know, those have been the biggest successes in my community. Thank you so much for sharing the inspirational efforts in your community. I'm inspired by them. <laughs> oh, that's good. I'm glad, I'm glad we got that in there. Me too.